reading from the second book of Samuel. Absalom unexpectedly came up against David's servants. He was mounted on a mule, and as the mule passed under the branches of a large terebinth, his hair caught fast in the tree. He hung between heaven and earth, while the mule he had been riding ran off. Someone saw this and reported to Joab that he had seen Absalom hanging from, the, from a terebinth, and taking three pikes in hand, he thrust the, for the heart of Absalom, still hanging from the tree alive. Now David was sitting between the two gates, and a lookout went up to the roof of the gate above the city wall, where he shouted about and saw a man ri running all alone. The lookout shouted to inform the king, who said, If he is alone, he has good news to report. The king said, Step aside and remain in attendance here. So he stepped aside and remained there. When the Cushite messenger came in, he said, Let my lord, the king, receive the good news, that this day the lord has taken your part freeing you from the grasp of all who rebelled against you. But the king asked the Cushite, Is young Absalom safe? The Cushite replied, May the enemies of my lord the king and all who rebel against you with evil intent be as that young man. The king was shaken and went up to the room over the city gate to weep. He said as he wept, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. Absalom, my son, my son. Joab was told that the king was weeping and mourning for Absalom, and that day's victory was turned into mourning for the whole army when they heard that the king was grieving for his son. Verbum Domini. Listen, Lord, and answer me. Incline your ear, O Lord, answer me, for I am afflicted and poor. Keep my life, for I am devoted to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for to you I call all the day. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in kindness to all who call upon you. Hearken, O Lord, to my prayer, and attend to the sound of my pleading. Let 
Lectio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Marcum. Gloria Domine. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him, and he stayed close to the sea. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus came forward. Seeing him, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, saying, My daughter is at the point of death. Please come lay your hands on her, that she might get well and live. He went off with him, and a large crowd followed him. There was a woman afflicted with hemorrhages for 12 years. She had suffered greatly at the hands of many doctors and had spent all that she had, yet she was not helped, but only grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. She said, if I but touch his clothes, I shall be cured. Immediately, her flow of blood dried up. She felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Jesus, aware at once that power had gone out from him, turned around in the crowd and asked, Who has touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You see how the crowd is pressing upon you, and yet you ask who touched me? He looked around to see who had done it. The woman, realizing what had happened to her, approached in fear and trembling. She fell down before Jesus and told him the whole truth. He said to her daughter, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be cured of your affliction. While he was still speaking, people from the synagogue official's house arrived and said, your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher any longer? Disregarding the message that was reported, Jesus said to the synagogue official, Do not be afraid, just have faith. He did not allow anyone to accompany him inside except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they arrived at the house of the synagogue official, he caught sight of a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. So he went in and said to them, Why this commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but asleep. And they ridiculed him. Then he put them all out. He took along the child's father and mother and those who were with him and entered the house where the child was. He took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha kumi, which means, Little girl, I say to you, Arise. The girl, a child of 12, arose immediately and walked around. At that, they were utterly astounded. He gave strict orders that no one should know this and said that she should be given something to eat. The Gospel of the Lord. I want to begin with today's two readings. Both are extremely rich with the story of Absalom dying. Keep in mind what had happened. Absalom had rebelled against his father and he built up towards it. He had a plan. He was going to undo his father's government by changing the decisions in court. He would tell people, ah, the king's busy, come to me. And he would decide cases that were favorable to various people that could help him. And then after he'd built that up, he went down to the south of, from Jerusalem, called everybody together for a feast, but in fact, in fact, he was calling them to a rebellion, and they joined. They're already favorably disposed. 
he had taken his father's wives and concubines in public on the roof. He had taken them. And then, and David had to flee to what is now Jordan, the kingdom of Jordan. And the battle takes place in Jordan, and the young man's hair was let loose. The reason in, in peace, they would tie their hair together, and tighten it, uh, but more like a ponytail style. But in battle, you would let your hair loose. This was a very ancient war custom that persisted among many peoples. Even Native Americans did something similar, though far different culture. But it helps men go into a war frenzy so that they fight more seriously. But in his case, the flowing hair got caught in the branches of a tree as his mule is riding underneath. And mules and horses kind of do that to riders every so often, sometimes hoping they'll knock them off with a branch. Uh, in this case, he was hanging there and was killed um, by uh, his uncle. Uh, that's another part you don't see this, but um, it, it's his uncle that kills him, Joab. And David grieves the death. He, he should have been rejoicing. The young man had rebelled against him, caused a war against him, driven him, driven him out of his capital, he had taken his wives, thereby committing incest. I mean, all of this is a series of crimes for which David should have been outraged. But he wasn't. Why not? This is key to understanding this episode. Remember when all of this got started? It was when David had committed adultery himself with Bathsheba and then had her husband killed in battle by telling the troops, find a way to make sure he dies in the war. Well, David is at home, not part of the war, and sort of taking these, and then taking the man's wife. And the prophet Nathan had warned him that their, the rebellion will be inside your family. What you did to this poor man, by taking his wife, that is going to happen to your family. And you see throughout, as a matter of fact, it started off because Absalom's sister, there were full brother and sister Absalom, David had a number of wives, so Absalom's full sister was raped by a half-brother. And David couldn't do anything about that either. Well, you know, he'd, he'd committed adultery and murder. And so Absalom killed that half-brother. Well, I can't do anything about that either. And now he can't really deal with this situation. This is not only a problem for David. This is a human problem that persists throughout cultures, and we see it within our own, by which people who commit serious sins then find it difficult to deal with the sins of other people around them. How much do we see in our own culture where there is so much of a variety of different kinds of crimes of sexuality and violence and of various kinds of abuse and various levels. And then you see people say, well, you know, who am I to criticize somebody? I, I mean, you know, this is something that I can't do anything about. I mean, you know, um, you know this is what they chose to do. Do we not hear that kind of logic that comes from a weakening of the core of our own moral integrity that makes us incapable of crit critiquing other sins? And this is something that is, a, again, a human problem throughout history. 
And this is something that we have to deal with. In one sense, it applies in a certain way, not quite as seriously, to today's saint, Saint Hyacinth, or also known as Hyacintha, because this is a, a woman of Mariscotti. Uh, relatively old family, not real old, uh, goes went only back to the time of Charlemagne. Uh, her one of her ancestors was Marius of Scotland. That's why Mari Scotti is their last name. And he was sent, uh, remained in Italy after Charlemagne was crowned and helped keep control so the papacy would be safe. And their family became nobility and such and were well enough off, especially in the 16th century when she was born. And she was in love with a nobleman who was in love with her sister. Now, St. Hyacintha was a pious lady, but when the nobleman chose her younger sister over her, she said, I'll show him, I'll go to the convent, I don't need him. And so she goes off to the convent. However, there was, you know, because she's doing this out of her own sense of pride over being rejected, when she goes to the convent, she doesn't live the life of a pious nun. She brings in all sorts of luxuries with her. She wants to be a nun who lives like a noblewoman. So she had fine cloth instead of the rough cloth of the habit, and so silk and all those other things. And she has good food brought in and her own cook and you know so that she gets the the good quality of food to which she had become accustomed and it was only when she became sick that the confessor who brought her holy communion said to her when he saw the room and said you know what's all this luxury here then at that point you know, uh, he called her to repent, and then she did. And that's when she started to become truly holy. But this is something when we do things, uh, or make decisions out of our own sin, it weakens our resolve to do what is right. And this is, again, a common human problem that we need to learn from her. Now, as far as today's gospel, we see another aspect here. I just want to mention, because this is, a, 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 obviously, St. Mark spent so much time on these two healings. Lots of other times, the healings are done very quickly, in short little, little stories. This is one of the longest stories of healing in the gospel of Mark. And remember, he had just come, yesterday we heard the gospel of the man with the legion of demons. He lived on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. That was where Gentiles were. That's why they had a herd of pigs. That's the Gentile side. He came back west to the Jewish side of the lake. And notice these miracles deal with something more Jewish. First of all, the woman has a hemorrhage which made her ritually unclean. She was not allowed to worship at the temple or the synagogue. It made her ritually unclean. Because you can't have flowing blood you know, at, at, in the temple and such. And the, she's also sick for 12 years. And the little girl is 12 years old. The woman became ill at the time the little girl was born. And in some ways, they both are symbols of Israel with its 12 tribes. They're a symbol of Israel that has faith in the case of this woman. And she stands very much in contrast to Jairus. Jairus is the synagogue leader. He's a part of the Pharisee party. And he, you know, has faith but he wants Jesus to make sure he comes over to his house to, to heal his daughter. And there's a tension about that faith when you get to the house because, first of all, the messenger says, don't bother the teacher. Or actually, he puts that as a question, a rhetorical question. Why bother the 
teacher, she's already dead. As if to say, leave him alone, don't bring him. And then at the place they're mourning, but their mourning is also fake. When they, they, they're grieving, they're weeping and all this. And then when Jesus says she's not dead, she's asleep, they start laughing at him. You can see that this is purely emotion that flips back and forth. And the woman, on the other hand, is quiet. She doesn't say anything. Her faith is a quiet faith that goes up, if I can just touch the tassel of his garment. She is that part of Israel that, on one hand, because of her hemorrhage, is an outcast, and yet being an outcast does not stop her from having faith any more than it prevented the faith of the man who was a leper, also an outcast, and said, if you, just, if you want, you can heal me. So also she understood that. And Christ could feel the power leave. And he said, who touched me? Now, the, this is a great part for us. And also fits, you know, St. Hyacintha. Because everybody's touching me. There's a crowd that I gathered when he got out of the boat. They're following him over to the house of Jairus. And people are bumping and pushing and all. And yet he says, who touched me? Why? Because these people are jostling around. They want to be around him like some sort of rock star. He's sort of a celebrity. They want to be with him the way tourists go to the Holy Land. I see them all the time. They would be tourists coming off of ships that come there. They want to take a picture, and then they go on. And they might as well be seeing the ruins of Greece or Rome or over the Holy Land. It doesn't matter because they're just tourists through life. Whereas this lady is like a pilgrim who has faith. She touches, and Christ can tell the difference. And this is something that all of us need to examine our consciences about. In that a lot of times, we are like the crowd bumping into Jesus in the, in the Blessed Sacrament. Well, everybody else gets up out of the pew. We all go up there. We all receive. And we're bumping into Jesus instead of going to receive the blessed sacrament with faith. And in one sense, St. Hyacintha, who was sick when, she, when the priest brought Holy Communion to her, was doing this because, well, I need, I need the blessed sacrament. She was willing to be bumping into Jesus, but when he called her to repent, she then received the blessed sacrament with faith by which Christ's power could come into her and transform her personality. And we ourselves ought to be coming to Holy Communion and the other sacraments that are appropriate to each one of us, not with bumping into Christ, but with a faith that allows him to touch us so that his power comes into us and transforms us as it transformed her. This is what we seek from our Lord and that he is able to transform us in ways that are far beyond our own comprehension. And we learn that from this woman, especially, whose faith is greater than the synagogue leader, but who shows us how to receive Christ ourselves as we touch him at the depths of our souls and hearts in this holy sacrament and the other sacraments as well.